opinion. Thank you very much, uh, Judge President. The Mondas operandi today um, from the side of the court was to deliver summarized versions of the judgment. The 150 plus pages will be at your disposal at your time that the president of the court shall advise. Um, the lead judgment carries all the uh, background to the case quite comprehensively, the history of these proceedings, the facts, submissions of all the parties, and the prayers sought. Um, I see no need to rehash that. But at a personal level, I shall read um, what I consider to be brief. The rest, those who are interested in reading judgments afterwards, shall read. To me, democracy is a perpetually contested condition. Uh, within it, through discourse, persuasion, contention, and reconciliation, we are constantly in mutability towards improving our condition through perfecting the substance of the norms and agreements by which we agree to coexist and flourish. Whilst we see this across our courts every day, there are certain matters that attenuate our constant pursuit of social political perfection. The petition before this court is one such. Within the context of our national journey towards per, uh, perfecting our constitutional democracy, the important role of this court and all parties to this petition becomes all the more apparent. The crux of this petition, as I said, is the extent and nature of constitutional amendment in Kenya, especially within our nation's history of constitutional development and more specifically the experiences and processes that birthed the Constitution of Kenya 2010. Any initiative that seeks to change that body of fundamental principles according to which we as Kenyans have agreed to be governed, our Constitution deserves the most attention of all Kenyans whose duty under Article 3 is to respect, to uphold, and defend the Constitution, and all state organs who under Article 2 exercise their delegated authority only through and in accordance with that Constitution. The history of constitutional development in Kenya has been laid out concisely and in detail, both in the High Court and the Court of Appeal, and even in our decisions. This history is most relevant in my view. This court, the Supreme Court, has on numerous occasions asserted the importance of historical context as a key tool for courts and tribunals in the interpretation of the provisions of our transformative charter. Through, uh, though a significant factor, it is not and ought not be the only lens through or the weightiest factor upon which we consider the questions of constitutional interpretation. Professor Richard Albert referred to in both the judgments of the superior courts below, speaks of the, quote, rise of unamendability, unquote, and the quality of formal amendment rules in terms of their availability for both good and ill as posing a challenge for constitutionalism in that though rules of change are indispensab indispensable for the functioning of constitutional democracy, they at once, quote, open the door to the demise of constitutional democracy itself, unquote. Therefore, we possess the question. How then, quote, 
Can we protect constitutional democracy from the misuse of its own devices, unquote? The late uh, Professor H.W. Kotho Gendo <laughs> illuminates this discussion by pointing out that it is pointless having a constitution if constitutionalism is not our concern. I am most cognizant of our history as a country as well as the history of the development of our much cherished 2010 constitution. I'm also aware of the principles developed by this court rega uh, regarding historical context in the interpretation of the constitution, a living document that speaks from the past through the present to the future. I must, however, state that the role of our cause must remain within the architecture of the Constitution. It is bound by it. All courts are bound by it. The exercise of discretion must be judicious. Though it is the court's task to breathe life into the Constitution and to ensure that its, con is, its text is constantly speaking to the transformative and emancipatory ideals therein, on the other hand, the text of the Constitution cannot be seen as devoid of meaning and content merely to be filled by ideas and opinions by those on the bench, no matter how laudable and noble and well-intentioned those may be. A balance must be maintained and such balance is crucial to the very architecture of our constitutional democracy for the courts too must not see themselves as immune to being inimical despotic tendencies. This is especially true in regard to constitutional amendment and the exercise of sovereignty as, a con uh, as acknowledged in the constitution directly and indirectly through processes that are prescribed in our constitution. The cost, ma the cost must seek to steadfastly and purposely defend and protect the constitution and constitutional processes through which the people of Kenya express their sovereign power. Not on the basis of justifiable apprehension, and no matter the nobility of the cause, employ judicial craft to retain certain moral or doctrinal limits into the exercise of such sovereign power. It is the sovereign, the people who must decide and responsibility of all state organs only exercise state authority as delegated by the sovereign. That is to remove all extra constitutional impediments to the free exercise of such sovereign power. This constitution has been stretched in its over 10 years existence, and perhaps this is the most serious attempt yet to espouse its limits in the wake of attempted amendments. To demonstrate the magnitude of this case before these courts, while the High Court framed 13 issues for determination arising out of the consolidated petitions, the Court of Appeal expanded them to 21. On our part, we found seven that required determination, and that's what we are doing this morning, this afternoon. That said, I now proceed to determine the seven issues as framed in summary 
as my understanding of the Constitution and the law allows me to do. And the first issue is that doctrine and the basic structure itself. If a doctrine is a legal principle of long usage that is widely accepted as such, then my finding is that the Kesavananda case is a judicial reasoning which cannot be elevated to a doctrine above the Constitution. And therefore, the Constitution of Kenya 2010, I find, has a basic structure. But as for the basic structure doctrine, I find that the same is not derivable from our Constitution, and that structure Whatever else it may be found and applied does not, in my view, apply in the Kenyan constitutional context. The manner and process through which sovereign power is exercised in this country is by the citizens in its different forms and is fundamentally important under our constitutional architecture and the constitution can be changed through other mechanisms not limited to the primary constituent power. The second issue, the president, in my reading of Article 143, cannot, no, not, not 143, sorry, Article, um, issue number two, the president cannot directly initiate changes or amendments to the Constitution. An amendment of the Constitution can only be initiated through a parliamentary or popular initiative under Articles 256 and 257 of the Constitution of Kenya 2010. Consequently, therefore, the Constitutional Amendment Bill uh, 2010 is unconstitutional. On the third issue, the second schedule to the Constitutional Amendment Bill 2010, um, I find no difficulty in finding that that bill is unconstitutional insofar as it directs the IEBC on not only the elimination of the number of constituencies, but also the distribution of the proposed new constituencies and the timelines within which to operationalize the same within the constitutional parameters that are given in Article 87 of the 2010 Constitution. The Commission cannot be directed. Article 89 was not even sought to be amended in its entirety. The bill, therefore, is unconstitutional in my finding. Uh, on issue number four, even before I decide whether or not the pre president can be sued first, it's important to note that there really was no proper service of the process, and the president was therefore not accorded an opportunity to participate in the pleadings in his personal capacity as he had been sued in his personal capacity. And I find further that um, Article 143, any interpretation of that article must come to the conclusion that the president or the person performing the functions of the office of president 
cannot be sued during tenure. And although their immunity is not absolute immunity to impunity, it is nevertheless absolute immunity during the tenure of office. Uh, in my judgment, you will see that I have said if any proceedings were begun before assumption office, they are stayed. That's what the Constitution says, and they are resumed or are fresh ones initiated after leaving office. On public participation issue number five, I have said where it mattered most, I found no reasonable or um, any degree of public participation, which is a value in Article 10 of our Constitution that I could um, consider allowing the standing of the actions that were done without public participation. This court set the test in BAT versus the CS Health, and I find therefore that uh, for me the test was not met. On issue number six, uh, the totality of my finding even considering what the findings in Isaiah B. Watt and in the Katiba case and the effect of the Katiba case on Section 5 were, I would rest with Article 250 of the Constitution and say that the IABC was not only properly uh, constituted with the minimum number that was required by Article 250, it had quorum, and nothing was shown to the contrary. The last issue, um, on the last issue as to the referendum question, I agree with uh, all my colleagues in this court and in the courts below that have said that the matter was not ripe, it still is not, the bill never went past um, the uh, IEBC for it to be submitted to referendum. I find therefore that uh, engaging in a discussion in that matter it's a complete waste of precious judicial time, and I would not get myself entangled in such a non-issue as that one. As to costs, this being um, a public in litigation issue, I would say that they lie with each party. And those are the orders. The body of the judgment shall give my explanations for each of my findings. I thank you, Judge President. Thank you very much, the Honorable the Justice Miru, Vice President, for that rendition. Uh, before I read the final disposition of the court, allow me